it's helped me personally and professionally as well, which is just, honestly, I just feel that the Boon Chef came along at the right time in my life. And it was just that ideal opportunity. And it just, it sparked so much in me. As I said, it gave me an opportunity to sort of keep my foot in the hospitality industry circles without having to, you know, go back to that environment, which was obviously having a bit of a negative effect on me. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Burnt Chef Journal, a hospitality-specific podcast dedicated to challenging mental health stigma and conversations designed to inspire a new, healthier, happier and more sustainable hospitality profession. The Burnt Chef Journal is proudly sponsored by Plan Day, the workforce management system that helps your business give a shift. From scheduling rotors ahead to tracking time and attendance, managing your team's careers to managing your budgets, Plan Day has everything you need to make your day work in one easy-to-use platform. Try it yourself with a 30-day free trial only at planday.com. Get your shift together with Plan Day. So this week, my guest is someone who is incredibly well known to the Burnt Chef Project and who has been working with us now for a number of years and not just working with us, but representing the Burnt Chef Project incredibly over in Australia and beyond. So I'm joined by Al Tomkinson this morning. Al, how are you doing? I am mighty fine, Chris. How are you doing over there? Good, a little bit damp as the summer is here and it's just absolutely peeing it down. But yeah, not too yeah, bad. Think... You've been very busy for us recently. You've been here, there and everywhere for the Burnt Chef Project over the last few months, hey? Absolutely, and I wouldn't change it for the world. It's been an amazing journey, nearly three years now, and it's just been sensational. Awesome. It has been three years. God, how time flies. It's Christ. Yeah, that has been a while with us now. So... Al, for those who have not heard of you or or not had the pleasure of actually meeting you yet, can you just explain us a little bit about sort of your history within hospitality and maybe then we'll come on to what sort of drew you to the Burnt Chef Project? Absolutely. I feel like my journey into hospitality was a little bit different to everybody else's. I was a very late starter. I think I was 24 when I first realized that there's a possibility I could make a career out of being a chef. Up until then, I suppose I was a little bit of an angst-ridden, hating the world, late teens, early 20s, really not knowing where I was heading with life. And I think I actually fell into cooking out of desperation. It was one of those things where I decided to do a brief course in all aspects of hospitality. So you had bar work, working on the floor and working in the kitchen. And I just remember, even to this day, there was just something about being in that kitchen and being in that environment and then atmosphere and just working with ingredients. And even though it was just very, very basic, there was something that was beginning to talk to me and it was something that, something for the first time in my life, I thought this is quite possibly something I can make a career out of. What was it that you felt was pulling you into hospitality? What was the bug that bit you? I think it was just that whole, and I think a lot of people talk about it, the camaraderie. There's a certain, I'm trying to find the right word, but it's sort of like a second family. You spend, you know, you're spending 15, 16 hours with these people and you really do sort of form these that goes beyond a friendship. You sort of form a little second family and, you know, you're there with each other in the trenches, so to speak. And it's, again, I think it was just something that at that time, I'm, you know, we're talking 24, 23, 24, I think I actually needed something, I suppose, in a way to give me a bit of a kick in the ass. And certainly working in the kitchen did that quite quickly. And what were you doing before? Sorry if you've mentioned it already, but what was the career change? What was the sudden change of influence? Honestly, I had no direction at all. I completed school. I just got over the line. I actually sort of tinkered with business studies for a while, but it just didn't really sit with me and it wasn't it wasn't something that I was really drawn to. I tried a little bit of gardening, but again, it wasn't really hitting the mark for me. And it wasn't until, even though I sort of found doing a little bit of bar work in that first course was actually quite exciting, it just wasn't until 
I got that chance to step into that kitchen and was bitten by the chefing bug. And I still think sometimes, you know, even though I was late to start, I think I I certainly made up for it then to be able to to do it for 22 years as a career and, yeah, just sort of established myself as a very reliable chef and someone that everyone could depend on. I was never really one for taking on head chef roles. I was always sort of, your, you know, your, your reliable number two. I was the one that, you know, if you needed something done there and then, I'd have it done before you'd even finish sort of explaining it. I was sort of really, really determined to just be the best worker I could be, but never really wanting to step into that, more of that sort of leadership role. What was it about the leadership role that you felt wasn't necessarily for you? I've got to say, and I've spent a lot of time sort of reflecting on this over the last few years now that I've been out of the kitchen. I think a lot of it came down to a lack of self-esteem. I sort of always looked at the other chefs I was working with and they always seemed to be really confident with what they were doing and they were able to bring new ideas to the table and just sort of carried themselves with that sort of, dare I say, chef swagger. And I always thought I was a little bit different. It's just sort of a little bit more introverted and and quieter. And I just sort of never really thought that I could really fit a leadership role, even though, there, you know, there were times I was thrust into that role and, you know, I was able to do it. It certainly wasn't something that I was aspiring to do, you know, day in, day out. Which is something that I will say from a personal level and from a professional level, having worked with you now for three years, is that I think actually you are a natural leader. You demonstrate through role modeling behaviors, demonstrate through the right attitude and the right aptitude and the right experience. So I would say for on the behalf of the Burnt Chef Project that you are definitely a leader, sir. And rightly so, you've, you've grown a team from just yourself to you know, big old team in Australia now, which is impressive. It is actually funny. When I look back on it, I sort of look at, you know, the things I'm achieving. I think a lot of that has come down to having a lot more confidence in myself and having a lot more belief in myself, realising, yeah, as you said, I do have those attributes which, you know, maybe with a little bit more guidance and probably just a little bit more self-confidence maybe in my career. Could have looked different, but the way I sort of look on everything is everything happens for a reason. And, you know, my journey getting involved with the Burnt Shift Project may not have even been a thing if if my career went on a different path and I had the confidence and I didn't struggle with self-confidence and low self-esteem and being the quiet chef in the corner, except when, you know, at the same time, I was also a very, very, very volatile chef. I was very angry. And I think. A lot of that was due to the fact that I did feel I wasn't good enough. I don't know if that makes sense. And this is another thing I've sort of been reflecting on a lot over the last few years is I feel like my lack of self-confidence and also my struggles with my mental health through the years, I feel like more often than not, my 22 years as chef, I was just an anxious, stressed mess for the entire time that I was in the kitchen. And as we all know, sometimes a little bit of stress can be a good thing, but I seem to just always put plenty of pressure on myself. And it just looks like that, you know, me sort of feeling like I was holding myself back. It would manifest as anger. And, you know, I talk to people now and I sort of say, oh, back in the days when I was a chef, I was just an absolute asshole. And they just sort of, now that they, you know, there's people that's worked with me for the last 18 months in mental health and they sort of think, We just cannot see any sign of that in you at all. So that's how I've sort of reflected back on it and I've thought maybe it was just a case of me just being anxious and stressed and being in a anxiety-inducing, stressful environment. It was just was working against me more than not. And I've spent a lot of time sort of reflecting on it and sort of thinking, you know, I'm actually quite embarrassed that I was that angry dare I say, Gordon Ramsay-esque chef. But I feel now I'm sort of with everything that I'm doing with the Burnt Chef Project. I feel in a way I'm sort of making up for the fact that I was an arsehole. This is my way of giving back to the industry and maybe, you know, sort of in a casual way sort of apologising to all of those people that I've abused or yelled at through the years. That's 
That's very, very vulnerable of you to be able to say that because there'll be many out there who just want to pretend that they didn't fall foul to stress and they weren't um, absolute dicks in the kitchen or in any walk of life. So it's great that you have this platform and you've also got the courage to be able to speak out and, and try and remedy that because... Yeah, it's huge. I think owning that, owning that mistake. And also, you know, I'm not absolving the behavior at all, but I also think that, you know, there are components of being in high stress environments that do ruin your emotional intelligence and do make you react in ways that perhaps you wouldn't if you sat on a beach, you know, or if you were reading a book, exactly. you know, you perhaps you wouldn't react in those ways and i think it's important to identify the fact that your environment does have a big impact on that as well as the way that you've been brought up and various other things but you know I, i've seen people within kitchen environments who have come in calm collected and due to chronic high levels of stress they've turned into caged animals that is definitely me i think it was just one of those things and i probably got a little bit better towards the end of my career but at the same time I just feel that you know I, I did a, another brief stint back in the kitchen uh, I think it was mid to late last year and I could notice those little signs just starting to come back again and that's when I thought yeah there's something about me and working in a kitchen and and my mental health that sort of doesn't work as the perfect mix I think in a way that was sort of my final little test to see if, whether or not I still had that drive and those feelings about being in a kitchen again and, you know, the excitement and things. But I think that was last year when I realised that I could feel some of those emotions coming back again and sort of, I suppose, a little bit of PTSD, you know, sort of the, the stress of the docket machine going off. And even now when I go out for dinner, I'll hear the docket machine go off and I'll instantly sort of think, oh, no, hang on a sec, no, I don't need to tend to that. I'm not on that side of the fence now. That is so, it's so interesting that you should mention that because perhaps it is a formal variety of PTSD where you have been in that high stress environment for such a long period of time that as soon as your brain, as soon as your body starts to experience those situations, those now noises, those heats, etc., it pulls you straight back into that behavior and into those feelings. So it's good that you could identify that. And so you've now moved on from the kitchen. What's your main role at this moment in time, Al? I am now working in mental health. So the organisation I work for, my job title is a wellbeing mentor. Also, there is some lived experience work as well. So I'm dealing with people aged anywhere between early 20s to 50 or 60 years old. I'm involved in... Obviously, peer work where there's a lot of just sort of sitting with people and um, listening to them um, sort of talk about their problems and we try and come up with ways that we can sort of lessen the effects of what's happening with them. We do a lot of work with linkaging into other organisations, so we may link them into a GP and a, a psychologist to sort of get that sort of medical help that they need as well. And I just honestly... I feel like I've probably been training for the last 30 years for this role. I feel like with my own mental health struggles for 30 years, I feel like everything that I've gone through, good or bad, has led me up to being in this position of working in this and just being able to be there for people and just being able to make a bit of a difference in somebody's life every single day. It's just an amazing feeling. It's just really cool to have people that, you know, you build these connections with and you build rapport with them and they're then able to open up to you and, you know, they may tell you things that they've never told anybody else in their life and it gives them that opportunity to sort of get a little bit of relief from maybe getting something off their chest that they've been hanging on to for a long, long time. Well, I mean... It's great that you found your flow, right? You found your your intrinsic value or your motivator that keeps you going. And obviously you bring that into the work that you do and have done now with the Burnt Chef Project for many years. So for those who are listening to this and perhaps always wondered, oh, how could I get more involved or what is it that a Burnt Chef ambassador does? Can you just explain out to people, firstly, how you came across the Burnt Chef Project and what led you to getting involved before we then start looking at what it is that as an ambassador and a chief ambassador you do. Absolutely. 
long story short, and I've sort of done I've done blogs and things on my Facebook page along these lines, and I I like to call this journey that I went on. I like to say I turned a breakdown into a breakthrough. So basically, I had two mental breakdowns in the space of six months across two kitchens. I walked away from the industry and I walked away from basically any form of training that I had. So I was in a position where I really needed to sort of pretty much restart my life at the age of, what am I, what was I? I was 46, I think. And I started seeing a life coach who started working with me to make me realise that I had more to give and I still had a purpose and I was more than Al the chef. I was Al the person. And I also had in my mind, even longer before this, I had this thought of one day working with chefs and their mental health. So it was through the life coach sort of making me sort of realise that I was more than my job title or my, as it was, former job title, that I basically thought there is an opportunity here where I can maybe live this, get further along the lines and start working with chefs and their mental health. So I had been listening to a lot of my life coaches podcasts who give you a shout out to Tommy Kendi who out there who basically calls a spade a spade in his podcasts and really makes you sort of think about who you are and, you know, the way that you carry yourself. And I will admit to Tommy that it got to the point where I'd listened to his podcast so much that I was actually bored of listening to his voice that I put Chef's Mental Health into a podcast search and the first thing that came up was the Burn Chef Project and I thought, well, this looks interesting. So I believe the first podcast I listened to was one you did very early on with Adam Simmons. It may have even been the very first podcast. But I remember listening to a few others and thinking, I really like what these guys are talking about. And this is really something I wanted to explore more. So, you know, I sort of then jumped on the website and I noticed it was a UK organisation. I can still remember to this day being a little bit disappointed that it was a UK organisation and not here in Australia. But I thought I'm just going to just casually email and just sort of, you know, give a bit of an idea of what I thought of what I was reading about and reading and learning about the Burn Chef Project and what I would really like to do in Australia. And that's when you guys told me about the Ambassador Scheme, which I hadn't looked into because I thought, oh, you know, being a UK organisation, I thought the Ambassador thing quite possibly is just the UK thing. So then I just explored it. I looked down, looked into it and realised that this is something that I'm really interested in doing because this is, you know, even before I knew who the Burn Chef Project was, this was something that I really wanted to explore sometime in my life. So long story short, I went through and applied and went through the interview process and Ironically, the same Adam Simmons who I'd listened to in that very first podcast I listened to was the guy that interviewed me. I remember we sat down for a half an hour interview and I think it went for an hour, maybe even an hour and a half. And then I think it was late November, probably early December 2021, I was announced not only as an ambassador but the first ambassador in Australia, which, to be honest, sort of, made me think, well, you know, I've just burnt out of the industry. I am was at the time I was working in a warehouse trying to rediscover myself, um, very, very introverted, and now I have this task of being the only ambassador for this organisation in Australia, which has 27 million people in it and 7% of those people in hospitality. So to start with, it was one of those things where I thought, I really, really don't know how to do this, how to approach it, where to go. Because, you know, it was sort of, you know, it was just me, me versus 70% of 27 million. I'm not even going to try and do the maths. So to start off with, it was very, it was very hit and miss. I wasn't really focusing on anything. And I think, I think it was actually my partner. She kept saying to me, it seems like you're trying to reach the whole of Australia all at once. And I just remember thinking at the time, well, you know, she's probably exactly right. And living in Melbourne, maybe I should just focus on, on Melbourne and just basically let it naturally grow from there. And I do remember the first sign where I thought people are starting to take interest in the Burn Chef Project here was when Danny Valent, who is a has her own podcast, food podcast, reached out to me and said that she'd like to do a podcast with me. And that's when I thought, 
yeah, this is just starting to make inroads into the industry. I think around about that same time, I decided to do something that I would naturally have never done. And that was to arrange to do a presentation and a talk in front of hospitality workers down in my old hometown of Geelong, which really was, I'd sort of look back now and I sort of compare popping into the local office works here and printing off Burnshift Project logos and blue tacking them to the bar area down at Sailor's Rest in Geelong to last week when I was at Marvel Stadium and um, with the big inflatable elephant, the lovely Sheila, and just thinking how far in just over, you know, two, two and a half years that this journey has taken me. Not just the Burnt Chef Project building up its profile here, but it's also, it's helped me personally and professionally as well, which is just, honestly, I just feel that the Burnt Chef came along at the right time in my life. And it was just that ideal opportunity and it just it sparked so much in me as I said it gave me an opportunity to sort of keep my foot in the hospitality industry circles without having to you know go back to that environment which which was obviously having a bit of a negative effect on me. Well let's just take a moment to stop and pause and just (laughs) really explain how far you have taken the Burn Chef project over the course of the last two and a half, three years in Australia. I mean, man, it's been, I remember those initial conversations where we're like, oh, look, let's not try and do too much. I know you want to change an industry over in Australia, but let's start small and just like agreeing with what you were saying earlier. And then to the point now where You've done multiple public speaking events. You have represented us at trade shows. We're working with Nestle out in Australia with the Chef's Golden Chef's Hat competition as well. How many events and talks and fundraisers do you think that you've represented the Burnt Chef Project at now? We've done the two trade shows, plus we've got another one coming up in September. Podcasts, probably four or five, and I know that I know that Diane App in Queensland has been on at least one or two podcasts as well. Events, honestly, I can't think how many we've done. I know the two initial ones I did were, I sort of looked back on that and it looks like a sort of, you know, cut and paste type thing compared to, you know, we were at Marvel Stadium, which is Melbourne's second biggest sporting ground last Thursday, I believe, and just having Sheila there and just, Speaking in front of, I think it was 120 odd people who we were speaking to. It was some um, ambassador, Chris, that actually had the pleasure of speaking at that one. And actually, I've got to be honest, I actually take a lot of joy now out of watching the other ambassadors do their thing. I feel like without blowing my own trumpet, I sort of have done the hard work to sort of build up the profile. And then, of course, with all the other ambassadors coming on board as well, they've all brought their own connections in their own I suppose their own experiences as well but it's sort of like I feel really really proud of where we've gone and sometimes if I'm having a really really shit day or I'm feeling a really really shit about myself I find that if I just sort of sit back and just sort of think about the owl that had to walk away from the industry in 2021 August 2021 to the owl who's sitting here doing this podcast now in 2024. I don't know how it's happened. I don't know where I found the drive and found the confidence, but whether or not it was always in there and it just needed something that I was truly passionate about to really bring it out and bring out the real owl. And sometimes I think, you know, I turn, believe it or not, I turn 49 on Sunday I feel like I wish I'd done this earlier in my life, but at the same time, as I said a little bit earlier, I've had to live the 30 years, 30 odd years of my life with my own mental health issues to be doing what I'm doing now and able to open up and let people sort of be vulnerable in front of people and sort of say, this is how it was for me. This is my experiences. Because then when I was a younger chef, I just always thought I was the only one that struggled with their mental health. And there is probably people listening to this podcast who are in exactly that same position as I was all those years ago. And 
just sort of you just keep battling on and you keep going on. And I think with something like the Burn Chef Project in people's lives, it's giving people that opportunity now to be vulnerable and open up and, you know, have those conversations that, you know, a 24, 25-year-old owl just would never have had with anyone that he's working with. It wouldn't matter how close I was working alongside someone. So, again, if the Burnship Project was around when I was younger, my whole journey may have been completely different. But, you know, we get dealt the cards we're dealt with. And as I said, I see everything that happens in your life happens for a reason. Even the shit stuff, when you sort of look back on it, and I sort of look at the angry, stressed chef that I was, I can now sort of unpack that and be able to say, this is probably why I was angry and stressed for the most part was because I was always putting so much pressure on myself and not having that opportunity to sort of talk to people about how I was feeling because, you know, back then you just didn't do it. It was just one of those things where you just sucked it up and you kept on going and, you know, you'd end the night and you'd end up in the bar at the end of the night and basically drinking away your problems rather than having that opportunity to actually talk about them. If you're enjoying this week's episode, consider heading over to our website and supporting our ongoing work in destigmatizing mental illness and creating a healthier, happier, and more sustainable industry by purchasing some of our branded merchandise. We have a whole range of t-shirts, hoodies, chef's jackets, well-being journals, plus a whole host more available on Worldwide Dispatch. All funds raised from sales of these items go towards free to access e-learning content as well as providing free support systems and help for those who may be experiencing difficulty with their mental health the help seeking behaviors that's apparent but honestly you've been incredible and you continue to be incredible for the burnt chef project and we're not just talking you on your own anymore you have 10 other ambassadors that you work alongside in australia there are more coming through daily as well. <laughs> like your team is growing, <laughs> your team is growing quick. And yeah, honestly, like it's been an absolute pleasure having you on board and continue to have you on board. You're, you represent the project beautifully and all of you guys do all of the ambassadors around the globe. You know, we've got, we've got ambassadors in Norway now in Colombia and South Africa it's not easy sometimes it is it does feel like you're fighting against a brick wall trying to recruit other ambassadors and get college torts booked in and stuff but you know your testament your proof for the fact that just day by day foot in front of the other so i guess from my perspective and from our from our listeners perspective you know there are going to be some people who are listening in australia currently they're going to be people listening from other parts of the globe as well what's the general response to the burnt chef projects over when you're doing trade shows and fundraisers, are there any particular services or support mechanisms that people are like, oh, my God, this is actually really relevant to us? I honestly think it is just the whole package. It's one of those things where people sort of think that this is something, and it's the most common conversation I have, is this is something the industry has needed forever and no one's really, I suppose, filled that void and people are just amazed that we are actually starting to talk about these things we've sort of gone from and that's what I sort of do when I when I'm talking to people about even people not in hospitality knows about the stress and the and the late nights and the long hours and things like that when I first started that was what I was always sort of highlighting and I sort of got to the point where I realized well no one really you know everybody knows that side of it and, you know, we've sort of talked about possibility of people doing things about it. And now that, you know, the Burn Chef Project exists, it's now that opportunity now to start talking about it. And, and that's where, I mean, even today I got a text message from, a, an email from a culinary school here in Melbourne, and it's just another one. And that's all coming about more often than not just through word of mouth. So it's people knowing people and it seems to happen a lot. I sort of go through phases where... I sort of think mm, things are starting to slow down a little bit and then all of a sudden I'll get three text messages and an email in one day with people saying, oh, we really love what you're doing and 
we really want to learn more about it and, you know, trying to sort of, you know, between my uh, full-time role working in mental health, I'm then trying to arrange to, you know, have Zoom meetings with people and just being able to sort of have their undivided attention and say, you know, this is the Burn Chef Theory Project. This is what we want to build. And I think a little bit in the way here in Australia, we've got the we've got the advantage that you guys in the UK have sort of got the tried and tested model. So we can sort of come on the back of that and sort of know that you've got that, the training and everything in place that actually does work and does get people's attention so that we know that we can then be confident enough to say that this is this is what the industry needs. This is how we can help you either as an individual as a, or as an organisation. That's It brings me on to a really nice point, actually, Al, which is can you explain to the listeners who, anyone out there, whether you're front of house, back of house, whether you're a groundskeeper, whether you're just, whether you're curious about the hospitality industry and you're listening to this for research, can you just let the listeners know what actually is available, often for free, to the global audience and, and, and even just to the Australian audience? You've put me on the spot there, haven't you? It's a test. <laughs> it's a test. <laughs> It is, it is a test and I didn't do my homework on that because I thought, you know what, everyone listening to this probably knows exactly what we have to offer. So, look, honestly, off the top of my head, I know that we obviously there is where I first got involved. Our first point of contact I had was with the podcast. Bird Chef Project also offers the Bird Chef Academy, which has, correct me if I'm wrong, 40-odd modules covering anything from nutrition stress management also obviously things like sleep it covers everything that maybe people feel like they need that little bit of extra learning there's a support support services there that just announced a first of its kind eap scheme which the people i've spoken to here in australia either are amazed that there hasn't been something like this in hospitality before or are just really, really happy to hear that somebody is actually starting to be there for hospitality people. And I find the best thing about those support services, and this is what I say to many, many people, is I feel it's really, really helpful for someone who maybe has just had a really, really shit day and they're sitting there in the bar and they've just ordered their fifth sixth, seventh, eighth pint of the night and, you know, possibly instead of reaching for that next one or asking for that next pint, just having those support services available where they can maybe instead of that next beer, they then make the phone call and they get that opportunity to speak to someone and I feel the most important thing is just there's an opportunity for them to be heard for the first time in their life be able to sort of express things where they probably and probably in a drunken state it's going to be a little bit harder for them to sort of get the words out, much like me doing this um, description. But it's that first opportunity and that's that first contact and then they know they've got those supports in place where they can maybe once they sober up the next day they may make a a follow-up phone call. Honestly, the website has got everything. Merchandise is absolutely awesome. I'm actually waiting for the day where I see somebody who's not an ambassador walking around the Melbourne streets with a Burn Chef, um, with Burn Chef merchandise on. That would be, I feel like that's the next sign that we're starting to really go places. How did I go? How did I go with the test? Mm-hmm. I think you did brilliantly, mate. I think you, uh, you're very, <laughs> very hard on yourself to begin with. You sort of signed yourself <laughs> off, but you you passed with flying colours. So the support mechanism, you, you very, very accurately described. And I think the, the thing about the support mechanism now that, you know, it is available, it is for free, it is global. And also we are getting reports that people who are using it are actually seeing the therapist face-to-face for free as well. So, you know, this is absolute game changer when it comes down Absolutely. yeah i just i met someone who works in the bar a wedding anniversary at the weekend i was a guest and she was struggling with the the loss of her father and i said to her look you know it, it might be helpful if you had someone professional to talk to she said oh i can't afford it and the waiting waiting times are too big and i said well you work in hospitality mm. i said phone this number 
And she looked at me and she went, but is it going to cost me money? I said, yeah. no, it's completely free. And you'll speak to a qualified yeah. qualified therapist who will be able to have a conversation with you and, and you know, go through sessions. And over in places like the States, Canada, Australia, if you email the email address rather than paying the paying for the plus four four number, you'll get a response within a day. So, you know, you'll, you're going to get a response from a qualified initially triage therapist. And then if you need ongoing therapy, it's there for you. So it's really, really important to push it out because it is actually Australia and North America that are using it the most at the moment with Europe following close behind and obviously UK at the helm. But yeah, we're seeing over 10% engagement rates with the, uh, with the global therapy service, which is nice. But as uh, as you and I have discussed many times now, we need to do more in terms of fundraising. We need to start raising much, much, much more in terms of donations to be able to purchase even more licenses and to support even more people because, yeah, there's, would you say, 27 million people in Australia with 7% right. being? Yeah, 7% in hospitality. I don't know if okay. you've done the maths while we're talking. 2.1, 2.2 million, I believe. Although now what, the way that my brain works, I'm instantly wanting to check <laughs> that out. 23 million, and it's a roughly 7%. No, it's 1.6. 1.6 million people working in, hospitality in Australia. So, you know, and if four out of five of those are experiencing or have experienced mental illness or chronic stress and need support, you can see how much money we're going to need to start funding this incredibly vital service. Yeah, so, um, totally. yeah, that that's our key area of focus. We have just taken on a, a brand over in Canada who are doing the Burnt Chef Burger now across all of their burger sites. So I think they've got 23 sites doing a, a benevolent burger for the burnt chef project which is fantastic so we uh you know yeah. we'd love to see any restaurants yeah. bars hotels you know we've got burnt chef coffee stencils now as well al they're a new addition in the last week or two to the shop so you can put burnt chef branded you can put the brain on oh. top of a cappuccino i wouldn't have thought you could make coffee taste better but i reckon with that on top of it <laughs> it might take it to that next level Chris. i reckon well, do you know what? We like the elephant in the room, like the giant three-meter-tall elephants we've got around the country at the moment, or around the world. We try what we can do to get absolutely in front of everyone. And you, <laughs> yourself, and your team have been a, a key component to that over in Australia. So, Al, uh, what's next for the Burnt Chef Project? Where do you want to see it going in Australia? You mentioned that you want to see more people buying the merchandise, and we do ship to Australia uh, three times a week. So... If you're listening to this, head over to our website and purchase. There's a, a cheeky little discount code on the website when you log in as well called Coupony10 that will give you a discount. But where else, Al, now that I've done that shameless plug, do you see the Burnt Chef project <laughs> going over the next five years? <laughs> I've said at the start of this year that this year would be the best year for the Burnt Chef project in Australia, and it certainly hasn't disappointed. And I can only see it getting bigger and bigger. Honestly, I just sort of fly by the set of my pants sometimes. It's just one of those things where I just sort of see which way the wind blows. And I've got to say the the thing that I'm really interested in is being able to get into our culinary schools and talking to the apprentices, whether they're chefs, bakers, butchers, etc., because they're the future of this industry. They're the future leaders of this industry. And I had a taste of that and I was at William Angles Institute on Tuesday. I was able to talk to 20 young chefs and there's a different feel for me when I stand in front of young chefs, knowing that educating them on their mental health and looking after themselves physically as well, that I feel like I'm even helping the next generation because I'm taking the leaders of tomorrow and giving them the skills that they can then impart onto their apprentices when they're in that position. So I feel that's the next big step is just just sort of keep growing it. As we said, what is it, 1.8 million people in hospitality and we've got 11 ambassadors in Australia. So that's still a lot of people per ambassador. And to be honest, the Australian ambassadors, and I'll put a shout out to the three Kiwi ambassadors and the one guy in Indonesia as well. I know that 
everyone is more than capable of being being able to handle 1.8 million people. But the more people we have involved, the more people then have contacts with, you know, organisations that could help us with some fundraising and, you know, we're talking about the EAP scheme and being able to grow that just seems like a no-brainer. It's something that, you know, again, if I if I had access to that when I was a younger chef, my journey could have been completely different, but, you know, we've, we've done that one. We've realised that I had to go through what I did to be where I'm at and I can only see us just getting bigger and bigger. You know, we've sort of got contact with the Australian Culinary Federation and the FSAA, technical chefs. I mean, we've got a bi-monthly piece in um, the food service rep EMAG, which has just been really, really cool to just be able to see us growing and having us in print and, you know, our, our ambassadors appearing in local newspapers and things like that, which is really, really cool. And I'm always, you know, I'll always skim through those articles to get to the part where it says ambassador for the Burn Chef project before I then go back and, and read the entire article. It's just going to go bigger and bigger and the more people we can reach, it's just a no-brainer. We're just going to get bigger and soon everyone will know who we are. I did notice a, a few times with the trade show that we did in Sydney that people would say, oh, I've heard of the Bird Chef Project, but I didn't know they were here in Australia. So that's sort of something where we're just sort of, you know, it's 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 getting there. And I noticed that really early on when I started my my little Facebook page. To start off with, it was just people that I'd either worked with or family or friends who were liking my page. And then all of a sudden I sort of started noticing names I'd never, you know, people I'd never heard of before. And then these people would sort of reach out and say, you know, I really love what you're doing. I would love to get involved or, you know, complete strangers sort of telling me their story and just wishing that the Burn Chef Project existed when they were a younger a younger chef. And it's just really, it's it's really humbling. And... It's just going to get bigger and bigger. And I have 100% confidence in that because I know that the work that we've put in and the work that we are putting in, you know, today we had Ambassador at the Sydney cook-off for the Golden Chef's Hat Award. So, you know, that would have been another 20 or 30 culinary students that we would have spoken to today. So we're getting there. We're doing it. And it seems to be, it seems to be ever since, we sort of tried to slow it down that it's actually gained momentum. So it's just, it's been amazing. It is just absolutely amazing. Well, shout out to you and your team and to everything that you've done. And I'm looking forward to, work, to working with you more closely over the next few years as we start to split further, well, the corporate structures from the Burn Chef project and start to let them take on a bit of a life of their own in terms of dialogue, in terms of mobilizing to the key points in each each of the countries. So that's something that's uh, slowly ticking along in the background, but due to 14 different countries, laws, tax laws, legal structures, it's a bit of a project. It's taking its time. I don't think you would have um, envisaged that, you know, all those years ago when you were taking those black and white photos that you'd be in a position where, you know, you're sort of trying to negotiate with different taxes and different laws and things. It is a bit like when you think about it, I mean, you, the the work that you've done over the last two and a half, three years is incredible. But when you think about the Burnt Chef project only being around, it's only been around for five years. And... Mm. When you say it, it just sounds so completely and utterly left field, but it has only been five years and we have representation in most of the countries around the world. We've got a global support service. We've got an e-learning mechanism that has all of those great resources that you've mentioned. And, you know, we're way over 30, 30 and a half thousand access points now for that. We have got college talks in places like Auckland, Sydney, Miami, South Africa. This is all five years worth of work. And we're, you know, and whilst our our organization commercially has grown to be able to start to cover some of that, we're still pumping out impact that really is deserved of a company or an organization five times the size of ourselves. So 
it's absolutely incredible and i th- and i hope that anyone listening to this understands that by supporting the burnt chef project whether that's through raising awareness purchasing merchandise listening to the podcast fundraising for us or getting us involved in your business you're not just supporting me as the ceo you're supporting our entire internal team of 30 you're supporting the 200 plus ambassadors you're supporting over three and a half thousand students a year plus also you know a few tens of thousands of individuals who are accessing the free support services and the other tens of thousands individuals who are accessing the free e-learning so now is the time to get involved and support the support the work of people like alan who you know volunteer a tremendous amount of time into getting the burnt chef project in front of as many people as possible so hopefully no one needs to lose their life endlessly or be exiting the industry because of poor mental health and al so what's next for you i hear that you've got a a a bit of a trip coming up next year is this mean it's official now that we're talking about it on the podcast yeah go for it go for it Yes, I've, I've made the decision I'm going to come over to the UK and I have a lot of family over there which I really dearly want to see again. You know, it's been 22 years since I was over there, so I'm looking forward to seeing my family again. Hopefully I get to see my beloved Liverpool FC play live at Anfield again. That would be, long story short, that was actually the, how I based when I was coming. It was based around a game at Anfield. So I was waiting for the fixture to come out so as I could finally um, confirm my dates and things. And then, of course, having the opportunity to meet as many of the Burn Chef ambassadors as I can when I'm over there would just be absolutely awesome. You know, I feel like I feel like I know a lot of them personally already just based on the Discord chat and just sort of being involved in that. And I must admit, I sort of lose track of how many ambassadors are being joining into that chat because it just seems to be, you know, one or two every single day from various parts of the globe. But no, I'm really looking forward to coming over and basically seeing where the Burn Chef project, where it all began and where the epicenter is. And um, yeah, just getting that opportunity to meet as many of the ambassadors as I can. Well, I'm, I'm incredibly excited. It'll be great to be able to host you whilst you're over here and get you get you meeting as many of our incredible ambassadors from the UK and you know maybe from from Europe. If we can try and get a a big day out planned, I think that would be ideal, and we can spend some time one on one, even bring you to HQ, which sounds quite impressive, but it's actually a lot smaller than people might think. <laughs> um, it just does a tremendous amount of volume of work, but yeah, we're very much looking forward to hosting you into. Maybe even joining you at Liverpool FC, although I don't watch football. So we'll, <laughs> I'll make an exception just for you. Oh, it sounds good. It sounds good. I might convert you. <laughs> I doubt it, mate. <laughs> You've got a big <laughs> task ahead of you. Yeah, seven, eight years of playing decent rugby. I'm going to be tough to convert. Al, oh, you've been an absolute hero. Was there anything final that you wanted to sort of speak about or let the let the audience know about before we wrap up for the day? No, I think that the most important thing is to check out what the Bird Shift Project can offer. And, again, being a UK organisation, we are now, I suppose I can say we are a global organisation. And hospitality is one great big family and everything that we are doing with the Bird Shift Project is completely adaptable, whether you're in Australia or Uganda. I don't know why I chose Uganda, but it's just I feel like being involved in it has completely changed my life, as I said, both professionally and personally, and I feel the impact and the change that we are able to make to the hospitality industry is well overdue and just support us for all you can because the work we're doing is just phenomenal and it's been a you know, we were talking about in five years how far it's come. Just imagine, you know, over the next five or ten years, just how much bigger it's going to be. Yes, sir. Well, let's hope we are, well, I'm aiming for five times growth in five years, so let's see where we can go. Yeah, we need a whole lot more elephants out there. 
thank mate thank you ever so much if people wanted to find you where can they get in contact with you you know they reach out for me on my facebook page which is called don't put your mental health on the back burner which actually i must talk to you chris about possibly getting that on the back of a t-shirt because i think that's just an awesome slogan or we also have our australia at the burnshipproject.com email address as well which you can reach us there as well Ace work, man. Thank you ever so much. And can I just say on a final note, happy 49th birthday to our chief ambassador of Australia for Sunday. By the time this airs, you will have already crossed the threshold into 49, mate. So whilst it hasn't happened yet in the real time, belated happy birthday for you then. And I would like everyone who is listening to this to comment on the podcast and say happy birthday to Al because he's an absolute <laughs> fucking legend. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. I'd have to say it straight back to you as well. You're an absolute legend as well, and you've it takes a lot of a lot of guts to sort of say, I'm gonna start doing something about this industry and and deal with things that have never been talked about. And I know that you are a very humble man and you won't accept that, but honestly, you have changed my life, as I said, professionally and personally, just by making the Burnship Project exist and just building it up. And I think everyone feels the same way as me, that you were the one that just sort of said, right, we need to start doing something about this before before we start losing great people, either from the industry or even worse, from from the world. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. I just enjoy having conversations like this with you and seeing and seeing how far and wide that impact has has spread. So, yeah, thank you. I do appreciate that. I I don't do very well with compliments or <laughs> so. Yeah. I think that's a lovely point oh, to God. wrap up this episode. Al, what time is it at the moment over there? It must be. I've got eight o'clock. Uh, tonight, it's yeah? Just past just past seven. Seven. So it's nearly dinner seven. time. I've gone for a belated dinner with the family. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time, man. And uh, th- again, thank you for coming on here and being so honest and sharing your experience and representing the Burn Chef Project in such an incredible way. And yeah, we're looking forward to getting this episode live. No, thank you for having me. It was an honor to be asked to do the podcast. I mean, you know, that was the first port of call for me. And, and now I'm a guest and it's, yeah, again, very, very humble. Thank you for having me.